Today we will be talking about files and a little history, perhaps still the current story. In our companies we used to have and may still have our own file servers. We are storing our files, we're taking care of our own backups. We have a way to bring the files into our organization. It may be automatic, we may have our own FTP server. They may be delivered through emails. We may even give them, get them manually. And we have, through the years, uh, in the older releases, figured out a way to get them imported into our business ERP system. Now, most of us would have wanted to implement the job queue and have the uh, import automatic. Depending on where the files are located, it might be possible, perhaps not. I have seen cases where customers have needed to use .NET on client and running the Windows client in order to get access to the files, just to be able to automatically import them from there. And of course, the manual is always the safe way, and uh, a lot of companies are using that today. And also, whatever file format you are getting, we are used to writing our own code to handle that file and get that file into our documents or our tables, wherever they need to end up. So, file shares, drive S, H, whatever. We could mount file shares from wherever. And this is our current story. I believe that most of you should be able to relate to having your local organized C drive, you have a folder called work, under that you have the customer, under that you have whatever. So you have your own structure, you feel comfortable with what you're doing, and you know where to pick up the file whenever you need that file. Now, and this is perfectly good and all working for Business Central and NAV on-prem. But we are going not just into the SaaS world where we can uh, get access to Business Central in the, in the Microsoft Cloud. We are also going to the world where we have a hosting partner that is hosting our Business Central. Not necessarily Microsoft, perhaps someone else. But in the same story, we do not have access to their file system and they do not have access to ours. So how do we bridge that gap? First, let's introduce myself. My name is Gunnar Gesson. That four in the middle, I know there are some Icelanders up here which can help me with that. This is uh, the same name uh, you see in the Avengers movie. This is the lightning, the god of lightnings. So this is Thor. I don't know why the presenter did not choose to use that. Here you can see my information. This is my own little company back in Iceland. I have been uh, working in this business since 1994 and have been an MVP for seven years now. Uh, been on stage here before and it's always a challenge. Big screen behind me, a lot of people up there. And it's great. We all need to do this at least once, right? So today, I'm uh, going to be talking about these topics. And we cannot talk about files without talking about the data exchange framework. So, one question. Are you using the data exchange framework in your current version? Can I have a show of hands? Exactly. That's why I'm going to talk about it. How about the job queue? All of you using the job queue? That's much better. That's much better. And incoming documents. That's almost the same as the uh, data exchange. So this is why I wanted to uh, pick on these topics for uh, this session. The data exchange framework is something that Microsoft delivered first in uh, 2013 R2, if I remember correctly. And the idea between the data exchange framework is that you have a destination where you need to bring your data. Uh, in 
their first uh, example, I think we had bank account statement. But you may have different banks, different file types, different APIs to talk to. But, and uh, that's why they introduced the data exchange framework. In that framework, you can customize the flow of data from the start to the beginning. From the start to the end, that's it. Okay. Now the job queue has now in uh, later releases uh, been built on top of the new task scheduler. I'll talk a little bit about that. Incoming documents is kind of the inbox for Business Center when enough. This is where files are being dropped and then processed. Uh, I'm gonna show you a few demos on file services. Just uh, uh, there are here four demos that I'm gonna do. There are more. And then in the end, I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about document scanning because that's kind of a new story now. Now let's start with the data exchange. So what is data exchange framework? This is a, a process definition of importing and exporting files. You define the process both for import and for export and you define the lines and the columns of your data. And bring between the data and your actual database or your tables, you need to map field by field. When we are importing data, we might want to transform the data. And that's why we have transformation rules. So you bring in a text, and that text needs to be transformed in some way in order for Business Center to understand what it's about. An example of that would be I'm importing my credit card statement into my ERP. And a part of the amount field is ISK, which is the Icelandic kroner. And of course, I cannot evaluate that into a decimal. So I need to cut out the ISK before I can evaluate that as a decimal. And that's one of the things that the transformation rules can do. And then I'm going to spend uh, a few moments uh, demoing how to extend or a way that we can extend the data exchange framework. So, first about the process definition. This is, uh, as you should be able to see the, the title name of the page. This is data exchange definitions. And these are the definitions you will see in Kronos International today. Mostly about importing invoices into our purchases. UPL invoices in the Europe. And what we also have a bank statement import and we have a definition for our currency exchange service. If you look a little closer at this fact, the process goes from right to left depending on if you're importing or exporting. So data import begins on the right, you execute the feedback code unit, and then you move to the left, and when you, get, when you finish that track on the left side, you go into the mapping process. If you're exporting, you start with the mapping process and then you go to the right until you end up in the feedback process. And the feedback process is all about the user. So feedback process you use when you're doing things manually. So you can ask for an authentication if you need an API call, or you can ask for a confirmation that you want to start things, and the same thing in the other end if you're exporting. You can notify the user that the, the export has been finished or the import has been finished. Now this code unit here, this one takes care of reading the actual file. That is, taking that piece of blob, that is the file, and putting that into a table in NAV or Business Central. And this is the table it's going to be in. We have this data exchange table, there's a value, a file content blob value field, and this field will contain your file. And it doesn't matter if a file is imported from your file system, uh, if you download that file from an API or wherever, 
this is where the file will be stored, and this is our first task when we're importing file. If we are exporting, this is where the file will be brought from and exported or uploaded to your destination. Third step is to actually read the content of that file. And that content is being read into fields, into a table called data exchange fields. And here we are utilizing the column definitions and the line definitions. And the other way around, if we are exporting data, this is where we take the data that we have in those fields and create a document layout, an XML layout, for example, using an XML port. And the arrow here that is pointing between that code unit and the XML port is because it's always the code unit that is executed. But there is a code unit that actually executes that XML port. So you are never using both of them. It's either or. And this would be the, fi the fields table. And you can see that the data that we bring in or the data that we're bringing out will be in this uh, value field, which is currently 250 characters. And that might be an issue for us. Because we will find, our find uh, examples where we need more than 250 characters in a field. And what they did now in version 14, I believe, is we now have a value blob as well in this table. So we have a function to set value and we have a function to get value. If the value is too big to fit into this text, it will be stored in the blob. And if you need that in your older versions, just take a look at how it's done in that version. This is a screenshot of the line and column definitions. So for each line definition, you have this specific layout of the data. If you have an Excel file, then you might read this is the header line and this is the details line. The same thing goes with the XML file. You have this node, which is the header information, and then you have another node that is the line definitions. And this is an example of the, uh, of the UBL format. And we have the headers and we have the lines. And each of those has its own set of columns. And in the columns, we can define this column number. This one is this X path or is this string between this and that. Or if we have a variable delimited file, we can say this is column one, two, three, and so on. So we have pretty good control over defining our fields from the imported data and as well to the exported data. The validation code unit, we can use that just to validate the content in the fields table. As you can see, Microsoft is not using that here in these examples. And I, be I even believe that their standard process is not even executing this code unit if it is there. But that's the main purpose with this code unit. That's to validate the field content. Now, finally, in this process, we have a data handling code unit. And this code unit is always 12, 14, if we are using the data handling functionality. So what is the data handling part here? In the data handling, we are copying the data that we have in a data exchange field over to another table that has another layout, a little different structure. And that table is called intermediate data import. So if we are using intermediate data import, we need to specify code unit 1214 in this place. And let's take a little bit into that. This would be the layout, well, the first fields on the intermediate data import. And the value in this table is structured a little different than the values in the field table. So let's scroll back a little bit. Here we have the fields table. And as you can see, this, the data here is by lines, by record, and by field as the line definition specifies. You can see that, see that on the first fields. 
if we go forward again into our intermediate data import, the data here is structured by the destination table. So it's the table ID in our business central, it's the field ID in our business central. So the data is kind of moved in a way so that we can easily handle that from our business central point of view. We do have a problem here though, in this record, we have no space for a value blob. So we will need to figure out a way to get the data through this process if we have a big, big value. We might even have a base64 encoded PDF document in our XML file that we need to be able to handle. Here we go into field mappings. This is from the line definitions. Each line definition can have one or more field mapping. It's not requirement, it can have one or more field mapping. And we will have different field mapping based on the target. Are we gonna, is the field mapping directly into a destination table or is it into the data or into the intermediate data import table? And let's see the difference between those two. This would be the currency service import. And this one is automatically created when you configure your currency service import. Table 330, that's the currency exchange table. So we are importing data directly into that table using a mapping like that. And you can see that there is a flag there specifying if this is an intermediate data table or not. And look at the columns that we have to set up the destination. We have the columns from our column definitions, we have the name from there, and we can specify which field in our table 330 the data will end up in. And we have this optional field which specifies that, well, we might get a, an XML file that sometimes has this value and sometimes it's blank. So if we, if we get data that sometimes has value and sometimes not, we need to, to mark this as an optional. And then we also have the uh, possibility to add a transformation rule. If we look at the other way, well, this first, is there any way for you in the back to see this code? I don't think so. Well, you will get the slides. It's going to be on Mibuzo. So you will have to believe me when I tell you what's there. So this is a code that is importing using a field mapping from directly from data exchange field into the target table. And this one is using record references and field references. So this is kind of a universal code that you should be able to use more or less in whatever process you need. However, this code is currently inside a bank statement import procedure. So you will need to bring that out and you will need to create your own field mapping code unit to handle your code. You might find a way to do a generic one, but in some cases you will need to create a specific field mapping for a specific data. But this is the skeleton you would use in almost all cases. So this one is looping through all the records being imported based on the line and column definitions. And then it's going to pick up the, the uh, field mapping and insert the data with validation into the target table. So this just gives you the flexibility to get whatever data and whatever mapping into whatever table. Next we look at the uh, mapping into the intermediate. And there we see this is table 1214, and this is always table 1214. This is the same number as the code unit that we saw. So 1214 is a number that you will remember from now on, because this is what we will be needing to use in our daily work. The difference in there is in the lines. You can see that each line has now a different set of columns than it had before. We not only specify the column or the field number that we are importing into, we also can specify different tables. So by this structure, the data is 
formatted into the import data or the data, yeah, import intermediate data import table. And we also have that uh, optional field there, which is, which is uh, well, it might be hidden. We have the transformation rule, and we have something called the validate only. The validate only is is uh, thought exactly as you said. We are not going to use that data as an import data, but we would like to validate that the data in there is whatever we are thinking about or whatever we need. For example, we can see that the GLN number is validate only. That's because if we get an invoice, we would like to match that the incoming GLN number matches the GLN number for our companies. We are not going to ac accept an invoice for another company in our data. In this mapping, we can also see we have option for three mapping code units. Uh, we can put in logic that happens before we actually map stuff. And what we do there is, like in this example here, we are mapping that description to a GL account. We are searching for the vendor. And we can do all kind of modifications to the data that we have in the intermediate table before we actually execute the mapping part that is in 12.18. 12.18, as the mapping code unit, it is required. You need to specify a mapping code unit. The pre and post, they are optional. And the code to actually apply the data from the intermediate data into the tables is that simple. It basically loops through the intermediate data for uh, this specific table, and then it initiates a record and applies the data. Now, the transformation rules, we have a table in Business Central with predefined transformation rules that can do a lot of things. And we have these types replaced. We have regex, we have uh, date time formatting, which means that we can specify our, uh, our local settings for the date. We can import US dates, Danish date, Iceland dates, whatever. And we also have this, uh, if you look at the bottom there, we have a custom, which means that we can write our own code unit, shove it in with an extension, and it sh if we do that correctly, it will be discovered as a transformation rule and we can use that in our code. And that one in the bottom there, the Unix timestamp, this is an example of a code unit that is a single code unit that is a transformation rule. Do we have any idea what a Unix, Unix timestamp is? Yeah, we do. Seconds since Jan January 1st, 1970 or something like that. So it's just a big integer number that can be converted into a date. And the type helper, of course, in Business Central has a way to do that. So let's look at the extending part. This code unit 1240, this is the code unit that's supposed to bring the file into Business Central. And let's look, if we, if we look at the code, in Business Central they have added an event into that code. This used to be just a file picker and nothing else. But now we have an event, so we can actually do something before the, the code unit pops up a file picker for the user. So this gives us new possibilities. Let's also look into an example where we can extend this one. And what I like to point out here is this new code unit that you see in the bottom. It's a code unit called Templop. And this is one of the breaking changes between version 14 and version 15. Uh, I believe that Templop table was the table that I used the most. So now I'm switching to the Templop code unit and you will have to do that same if you're not already there. Templop is the uh, intended storage for a binary or a big data. Then, then you can pass things around with that code unit like it was a like it was a record, yeah. 
behind that code unit, there actually is ta a table. So what this code unit does is I have the possibility to use that set procedure to inject data into that code unit, and then it will subscribe to that event and deliver that data into that 1240 code unit. But there's one thing that I would also like to point out here, and this is something that I believe all of us need to know a little better. That's the first line there called an event subscription equals manual. So we have been using the eventing model for a few years now. There's something that happens, 1240 triggers an event, and we have a lot of code unit answering that call. But we should be trying to control who is answering the call and who is not answering that call. And what we, what we do is we put this property on the code unit that's supposed to answer the call. And then we enable this in our code and we dis disable this in our code. That's, why, that's how we make sure that we are not calling something, initiating a code unit, if we don't need it. And how do we do this? This example here is uh, the bank statement import. When we import a bank statement, we use this format, we call code unit 1270. And that code triggers that data exchange framework flow from back to finish, and we should have the data in our bank statement. We can, of course, replace this code unit with our own, and this could be an example of our own. We have here a code unit that's, that's just doing some preparation work, and then it's calling 1270, and it's returning. So, and the preparation work here, if we look closely, we are downloading a file, we are putting that file into that code unit that I showed you earlier, and we are using what's called a bind subscription. So what we do with this bind subscription is that we activate the subscription in that specific instance of that specific code unit. So, so not just any code unit will answer, not just any instance of that code unit will answer, but the, just this specific one. So if we have the normal subscription model, if we have a normal uh, code unit that's answering an event, that means that when the event is executed, a new instance of that code unit will be created, and that will answer that call. But that new instance will, of course, be blank. It will not have any data. So how can we make sure that the one that is answering the code actually has some data to deliver? And that's by doing it that way. We put in the data, we bind the subscription, then we answer that call, and then we unbind that subscription in the end. If you want to look close, uh, a little closer into how this is done in the standard application, you can look at the posting preview functionality. This, this is exactly what they're doing there. Now, that's it with the uh, data framework. We'll show you a little bit about that in the demo. So now I want to switch over to the job queue. The job queue is a background task, and it has been available for quite some time. Uh, Microsoft is using it more and more with each, with each version, and they have even now added something called a page background task, which is also giving us a lot of possibilities, but that's not in the scope here. So this is about automating tasks or offloading them to a background session so that the user doesn't need to wait for it. I upgraded my own ERP, I believe a year ago or something like that, and I used to send out invoices through PDF in the email. And I used to do post and send, and then I would wait 10 seconds, and it would be gone. Well, I upgraded the system, I did the same thing, I did my invoice, I pushed press and send, and boop, nothing happened. Well, it kind of looked like that. So I really needed to dig into it. What actually happened was Microsoft decided they would not want the user to wait these 10 seconds. Instead, what happened when I pressed the post and send, 
it actually scheduled a new entry in the job queue. So that background session was executing for 10 seconds and did the same job. And this is happening more and more in uh, the, the uh, Microsoft solution. We are seeing uh, data upgrades being pushed to the background session. And this is, of course, something that all partners writing their software should utilize as well. We do not want customers waiting for their ERP system to answer. We can also use this technology if we want to create an asynchronous API. If you want, for example, an API that will post sales order, we may not want the other end to wait while that post is executed. So we could trigger it. it will, that trigger will schedule the posting part, and then they can just ask, are you done? So back before 2017, we had something called Navision Application Server. Back in the days, this was our FinSQL without UI, it basically nothing else. And this NAS is still there in the product, but it's not used by the job queue anymore. So what NAS does, if we activate that on the service tier, it's it fires up a service, it fires up a session that does a specific job. It used to uh, loop through the database in the job queue and see is there something I need to do. And that means that the instance was talking to the SQL server every two seconds asking is there something I need to do. And guess what happens when Microsoft brought their solution to the cloud and their solution was asking Azure SQL every two seconds, is there something I need to do? Well, of course, they got a huge bill from Microsoft. So that was one of the uh, great things with that uh, cloud implementation from Microsoft. We actually are getting a better system out of it. And they figured, well, we need to find a different way than to ask the database every two seconds if we need to do something. So they built the task scheduler. It's based on the same technology that we see in our operating system. We schedule a task and the instance will just start that task when the time comes. And there's a table in the database to keep track of all our tasks so that the, if the instance is restarted, it will read that table and reschedule that task. And it's a lot more stable. It doesn't take out all the resources and uh, it's a better solution for us. We have a configuration. We used to be able to create a lot of job queues to have multiple sessions going at the same time. Now we have a configuration in the service instance which specifies how many of those tasks can be executing at the same time. 10 is the default one. I believe that's the same even if you have 100 tenants hooked to your application. So you might need to configure this based on the amount of power that you have in your machine. But we have always had problems with the task scheduler. There are problems with handling errors. We will have errors when we are scheduling tasks. Some tasks just don't start and some tasks just don't complete. So we will need to figure out a way or a workaround to at least manage these things. And I'm here suggesting three options. The first one, make sure that the user will know if something is failing. The second one, make sure that you have a task that cannot fail, that is responsible for all other tasks. The third one, create an error handling, some smart code that can actually look into what's going on and fix or restart notify or something else if something is failing. A simple way for the UI, add a queue box on the UI with a number of failing jobs. So at least the user has the possibility to do something about it. The second here, and this is the uh, exactly the code that I'm gonna be demoing or in the demo. This is the code that is running every X minute. And this code shouldn't be able to fail. 
because the only thing this code does is actually spin off new tasks. And since the task scheduler and everything about the job queue is designed in a way, so this shouldn't be able to fail. This should always be executing. Even if all the subtasks are failing, this should be running. The same thing goes for the monitor. You maybe saw that, maybe not. The second task this handler is starting is actually the monitor, the error monitor. So it will spin up the error monitor, the, it will take a quick look at the status and then finish. And what the error monitor does in this case, it checks four different code units. If they have error, it's going to tell someone about it, update the status somewhere, write in the activity log, and it's going to restart that service. Of course, in some cases, you might need to put some smart logic into this and figure out, okay, it's now stopped 10 times, let's not restart it, let's do something else. And of course, when you're starting jobs, you shouldn't be starting jobs that are already there. So just verify that you have a job, that code you need running for that record, and uh, you don't want to start it unless, unless there is a missing one. So that's it with job queue. I said that incoming documents is the entry point or the inbox for documents into NAV. This is the place where we get documents that are supposed to be converted into purchases, sales, and GL journals. Of course, we could utilize this to do our own formatting as we want. And for each incoming document, we have a set of attachments. Uh, one, the one attachment that is the main attachment is always the XML file. And that file is used to process that incoming document into our purchases, sales, and so on. There may be a binary document, and we have built-in OCR service, or at least we can usual, utilize a built-in code in Business Central to send our binary document to an OCR service, which will deliver an XML document, which will then be the main document. And we can have multiple supplemental attachments as well. So we could have a PDF document that is, for example, with the original UBL invoice as a supplemental attachment. And when we use this process of posting or creating a document and posting a document that originates in the incoming document, we will have the full traceability throughout the system. So in our GL entries, in our customer entries, in our vendor entries, we will be able to see the original incoming document with one click. So this is the, this is the place that Microsoft intended for us to bring our document into the, into the system. Of course, this is and should be available from the role center. This would be, uh, we have here 12 incoming documents. And the incoming documents are with their own status. And the status, of course, can be new and then all the way up to be posted. There is also a flag in incoming documents specifying if it's handled or not. And if the document is handled, it's not going to show up in the role center anymore. And we have multiple ways to get data into our incoming documents. The standard one is the manual one. We just click this button and we import whatever file in there. If you open Business Central up in your phone or, or tablet or use the Universal app, you will see import from camera. From my point of view, you should not be using that. And the simplest reason is that Im image that you take from your camera will be in full resolution in your incoming document. So it's going to be a huge image. At least for the modern phones, they're going to make huge images. For our goal here is to create these incoming documents automatically. So they should just appear as we go along. TradeShift is doing that already if we are using TradeShift in our business central. 
So the trace shift will download our UPL documents and put them into incoming documents. We could, of course, do our own custom data flow, or we could even attach a document scanning feature to this one. So you can say new incoming document from scanner and put your document into your scanner next to you. So this, it doesn't really matter how the data is created in there. But how is it processed? And that's, that's kind of a mystery for a lot of people. There is something called uh, data exchange types. And this is a list of possible types that you want to be able to process from the incoming documents into your system. And these four types, OCR, debit credit, and UBL debit credit, these are the ones that we, we have with the, uh, with the solution. And this basically is just a link between the incoming documents and the data exchange framework. So you can see that the third column there, this is the data exchange framework code, the definition code from the data exchange framework. So if the incoming document has that type, that specific data exchange framework is going to execute the logic. And there is a code in Business Central that actually is executed whenever there is a main document. And what this code does, is it tries with all those, in this case, four methods, it tries to read that file. And that file must be an XML file. It must end up in the intermediate data import because this one here is just going to count the number of records in that intermediate data import table. And whatever import generates the most of the records in the intermediate data, that's the one that's going to be selected and stamped on this incoming document. So you can create your own readers, your own process, and your own data types, just as long as that will create better results than the ones that are already in there. Then it will be automatically picked as the one you would like to use. So we could get all of these file types into our incoming documents through the data exchange framework, or we could even do that manually, but we must be able to convert those files into XML to have that main document. That's kind of the, the uh, thing that you need to remember. If you want to process incoming documents, there must be an XML file. All right. The user processes this with just this click of a button, create a document. This is not enabled unless there is an XML main document in the incoming documents. So fast and uh, brief introduction to these systems. So let's look at the file systems or the file services. There are, of course, a lot of services out there. Dropbox was probably the one first of them. Can I see, show of hands, how do we, are you using Dropbox? Not, not that much. Is there someone here who actually knows what Rust files is? One, two, okay. Because I needed to create a uh, connection with Rust files because they had, uh, a customer was using them. I guess I'm doing ad an advertisement for them now. Well, of course, we have OneDrive. We have OneDrive in uh, both in the old classical way linked to our live ID. We also have OneDrive in, in uh, our office now, OneDrive for Business, which is based off SharePoint. And we have these Azure blobs and the Azure files. Of course, there are more, Google, Apple, and so on. But what we really need to be able to use these guys is an API. And all of these, they have APIs. So Business Central will use that API to talk to these guys. And here is a few slides just with a list. Of course, you should be able to bring that up from Mibusa as well. If you want to use Dropbox, this is the client, this is the URL. And most of all, there is something there called an app console. So every user can create an app in Dropbox and that app is accessible by an API. 
I will demo that a little later. Rush files, the same thing goes there. We have a reseller, we have a company, and we have a token to authenticate to Rush files, so we can do the same things there. OneDrive is a part of SharePoint. Uh, we can download that OneDrive client to synchronize the data. Uh, the API is through Microsoft Graph, so we need to be able to authenticate to Microsoft Graph through Azure AD in order to use uh, the endpoints for OneDrive for Business. There is a new playground that we can use to play along with, play with the OneDrive for Business, and then again with any Microsoft Graph endpoint, which will now include the Business Center in SaaS environment. And I encourage you to look at this, this uh, Graph Explorer in Microsoft and see what you can do with it. Now, Azure Blob has been there a long time. And this is a, probably the cheapest storage you can find for any kind of files. And it's fast and it's easy to integrate whatever with Azure Blobs. When I, for example, when I started to use Azure Blob, I decided that I didn't want to save or store my binary files inside Business Central. So when I dropped a, a TIFF image or a PDF file into incoming document, instead of storing that in the database, I pushed it up to Azure Blob. And Azure Blob gave me a URL, and that URL is the only thing that I stored in the database. I like to push the binary data out of the database and just shove it into Azure Blob. There are uh, a storage explorer from Microsoft where we can use to just look at what is in our Azure Blob. We can upload, download, delete, and whatever. Uh, I found one software there called the GoodSync. That one can synchronize between A and B. I think this is a paid version. I just wanted to put something up there. So, but I could, was able to set up our synchronization between a folder and Azure Blob with very, very little effort using that tool. The API information is there on the Microsoft Docs. And the authentic authentication part perhaps is the most complex one, but we now have, uh, you, will have you will have examples both from Microsoft and from my repository, so you can easily grab the code that you need to authenticate to your Azure Blob. And you manage this through the Azure storage account in your Azure portal. Azure files, it's almost the same thing as Azure Blobs. The difference between Azure files and Azure Blobs is basically you can mount Azure files as a drive. And you can install a software from Microsoft to synchronize data from your server into Azure files. And it has a very similar API. So if you can talk to Azure Blob, you should be able to talk to Azure files as well. And it's managed on the same site. It has the same storage account. It can have the same access key. And we will, now let's take a look at that. This is, uh, I just wanted to put it in here. You will. It has no meaning here, but you can use the letter. This is the PowerShell script that's used to map Azure files on your computer, wherever that is. Now let's do a little demo. Uh, I'm here in a machine somewhere in the cloud. And this is the uh, storage explorer that I'm running. And I have here a blob container called session. And there is nothing in this container. If I switch over to my browser, I can see that I have containers here on the portal. And we can create as many ca containers as we want, as many storage accounts as we want. And we can place them in whatever region we want. When we have created our container, what we need is the access key for the container. So we need to know the storage account name, the container name, and the access key, which is here. 
Similar things go with Azure files. This is the same uh, storage account. It's just shares instead of files. So if we go to the overview here on the storage account, we see that we can create containers and we can create file shares and tables and queries, which is not in the scope here, in the same storage account. And in this demo, I'm just using the same account, which means that I'm using the same access key. If I go back into the storage account, and this is my session blob, I could just simply upload files th through here. And uh, let's just browse for them, because we need to have uh, we need to have uh, Business Central being able to see some files. So uploading them into the container should be just like that, and we should be able to verify that in our container in the portal. So in our session container, we should now have files. There is an upload and the download functionality in here on the web as well. So while we are doing this, doing development and testing things, we can of course verify everything just through the website. Uh, the PowerShell script that I used to map the Azure files results in a drive on my laptop or on my computer. So here I have a drive called S and this is my files on Azure Drive. And of course, we need to put some files in there as well. Let's do, let's do that. This would be, yep, let's go to the desktop. Here I have the demo files, and I want to copy some of them, any, any one of them, to my S drive. So, proof of concept. Now we have files in Azure files, and we can verify that as well in our portal. If we look at Dropbox, we use the app console to create the app. And when we have done our app, which is here in this example, is an app folder. We use this generate access token here to create the access token that we actually use when we link to this API. And what happens in our Dropbox, if we have an example here, is that in our Dropbox, we will get the apps folder inside the apps folder, we will have all our apps. And we of, let's drag some files into our Dropbox as well. More demo files. Now we have files in our Dropbox. But of course, we should be able to have files locally as well. We might have our solution on-prem. So this is my local drive from the container point of view because I'm running Business Center in a container and let's just copy a few files in there as well. So I have files now all over the place. Let's look at my PC. Hey, I also have the Rush files here. So that is also a drive and in my home folder in my import, I also have some files. So I've now placed files manually into a lot of places. So how about document scanning? We have been used to creating a solution that utilizes our Twain scanner. We have bought a solution from partners to do that. Uh, not to try and get you to return those products, but 
a document scanning is a feature that we have in almost any, every, on any equipment that we find. We have document scanning in our phones, we have document scanner on our, in our offices, and if we have file services, we should be, it should be both fast and easy to scan a document. This is the Office Lens app from Microsoft, on, on your phone probably already. It's quite easy to scan a receipt, an invoice with Office Lens. You can actually crop it and, and, and fix it up, and then you save it as a PDF in your OneDrive. And that should just end up in your incoming documents. This is the solution that I'm using myself. So I'm, I have my Dropbox app linked to my incoming documents. So if I go somewhere and spend some money, as a company, I need to make sure that I scan that receipt or that invoice into my app. And you can all see the name of the app. Of the, app. the app name is 2NAV. So it's quite easy. Whatever I put in there will be in NAV. And if you have your office already set up with an equipment that can scan, then, of course, that one can scan your uh, invoices and your attachments to an email, to a file, and wherever. Just hook that up to your file services. There's one else here, one, one more thing that I want to point out. Microsoft Flow is also a great way to pick up these uh, attachments, these uh, invoices, and put them into either a file service or even directly into your incoming documents. And Aaron Jan is going to demo that for you tomorrow. He's actually going to show you how he can send, or well I think he's going to ask you to send him an email, and that's going to end up in his incoming document by using Flow. But it's the same general idea here. And if you get invoices in your email, just drop them into the file API that's being linked. That's what I do. I just drag them into my Tuna folder in my Dropbox, and they will be in the incoming document pretty soon. Now, because we want to use the data exchange flow, we need to create a code that can grab whatever we put into the file content and put that into incoming document. This is an example of a code that does that. And just to make sure, I will give or I will give you all access to that demo code and that code that I have been showing here today. So you can all clone that one from Git and see what's happening. And you can see there in the bottom that if I have my OCR service active, we will actually send that binary attachment to the OCR service using the job queue. So, more demo. First, this is the Git repository. It's in DevOps, and if you go to this repository, you will get access to all this code. And there's a lot of code there. This code is just a proof of concept. This is not a product. Uh, but that means you should be able to find in there some useful uh, procedures, some useful uh, well, code examples. And if you need, use it as whatever you want. It's just, it's just there for you to use it. Now let's look at that product that I'm talking about. I need a password. The code has two 
uh, apps. We have two apps in the workspace. We have an AL app and we have a test app. It's broken down into functional areas. So the code will have a dedicated set of files that handle Azure Blob, another set that Azure, handle Azure files. The idea here is, here is that I have a framework and then I want to be able to add interfaces to that framework. One interface being Azure Blob, another being Azure files, Rust files, server file system, and so on. So if we figure out more APIs that we can hook up, then we can just add that to that framework and it should work. The general idea here is that the user should always expect the same constant environment. So what we have up here is we have something called the file providers. And here in the interface will self-register. We can have our local server environment and then we can have all those file services that I have already hooked up. For each of them, we have some kind of a setup. We have setup for our local drive. If we go into the Dropbox setup, we can see that we put in the Azure, uh, sorry, the access token. And we have a verification that this is the correct app that we are talking to. In Azure Blob, we need to specify the account, the container, and put in the access key that I showed you earlier. And you can even do this now if you've got a picture of the access key. The same thing goes with Azure files, just the share, the container, sorry, the share, the account name, and the access key. So it's quite easy for the user to configure this and, and make it work. I'm not going to go into the Rush files demo. But uh, this page that I have open here, this is a page I call import setup. And I can configure a more than one import setup for each provider. So I, let's say that I have, I would like to see all XML files from this Azure files. I should be able to configure something like that and I can go into process and just verify that I can see the files that I just copied into the environment. And this is the list of files. I can go into all of those and I, will prob I, I would be seeing the same results and this is the same UI talking to different interfaces, to different services. So what I also put in here is a data exchange definition code. Because when I bring that file into Business Central, I just, the only thing that this import part is about, bring that file into the file content and then the data exchange takes care of the rest. And let's do a, a short example here. We have files on the server. We can see what files there are. These are the files that I copied into my container directory. And I can decide that I want to create what I call import entries. And creating int import entries, basically importing the directory so I can see the whatever I put in my folder is now represented here. And these, this is something I need to do. I need to import these things. And I can go through the steps. I can import the content of the file into the data exchange. And I can also process that with data exchange to my incoming document. And when I've done that, I can navigate to the processed entry and I should be able to see the incoming document that I did. And based on the data exchange flow that we create, the destination may, not, may be something different than the incoming document. So the data exchange flow just decides where will this document end up. Is this going to be a sales order? That's very well possible. But of course I'm not into doing things manually. So what I can do here is I can actually go ahead and start each one of those with a job queue. So let's enable these guys. 
Es tut fast. So I have now enabled uh, five job queues. I should be able to see job queue entries just to verify that. And as specified, the job queue entry that starts is just the handler, the one that case takes care of spinning up other tasks. So now I have the job queue running, and these guys should be imported automatically every minute now. It may have started, it may have we are already getting files for each of those import setup into our system. They start by being new and then they will be processed and imported. So this is the, uh, this is the functionality that's in that app and this is the functionality that you can get from that Git repository. Uh, of course, being a Git means that you can create a pull request, you can fix things and uh, do things a little better. There's one more thing that I would like to show you because we have some time. Uh, there is something that was on the agenda that I have not talked about that is uh, called centralized setup data. So some of you might have uh, the necessi necessity to create a master data of some type. Posting setup, GL account, customer. Do you ever need to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And copy to 800 companies. Exactly. So a simple way could be to use a solution that's in there. It's, well, a proof of concept as well. We can use uh, something called a data packet setup. And let's say, for example, we, are, we want to use the customer table and for every insert or modify or rename on that customer table, we would like to push that change somewhere. And, but where would we put that change? We, of course, we need some kind of a destination. So let's... Let's find a data package destination. And let's create one. This is company one. And uh, company two. And the only thing we need to do actually is to link that to a import setup. So let's see that I want this company to be, or the data for this company to be created in this, in my server, and that one I want on my Dropbox. And let's unblock that one. So now the uh, destination should be set up and ready. The job queue that's that will handle this in background is not operational, but let's still try and uh, prove that this works. So we have a way to go into the customer through sales into a customer. Let's find a customer and do some changes to that one. And we should now have a document in our system describing the change that we did. So if we look at the code that was actually executed, there is a code unit in the platform that's called global triggers. And that global triggers will fire and ask, do we need to do something whenever we update a record in the database? And by using that one and specifying that I want to do something when I insert, modify, delete, or rename a record, these events will be executed accordingly. So I will have something called a data package B 
because I modified the customer. I call that create data package function, which is down here. And if we see the res if you look at the results, let's look at the data packages. This kind of surprised me first. I just did one change, but it's still four packages because we got the modify trigger executed four times. And we can, of course, this, uh, the, the layout that we see for this XML file, which is describing the change, of course, this is something that you could create your own and decide if that is what fits you. This is the layout I structured and decided that this would be enough to describe that this is a modification for a customer and I pass all the selected values with an XML file. And since we have hooked up the destination to our drives, that means that the, this XML file will be delivered to that destination. And if we look at company one or two, they just import these files and apply them with the same rules. If we need this to happen instantly, we could use or, or look into that, uh, that Azure functionality that Dimitri and Taranga are actually demoing right now in another session. But you could look at that video probably later. So that's the thing that I wanted to talk to you about. We have 15 minutes or so for, for questions, suggestions, or whatever. And I have a cat's book for you. Someone ha does someone have any question? Let's try it. There we go. Hello? Yeah. Um, in regards to the uh, job queues, is there a good, if even at all, is a possible way to prioritize different job queues or different job queue entries? If, for example, you have 50 jobs and you insert another one that is much more important, or is it just sequentially? No, in, in, the, in the current release, there is not. You just need to make sure you have enough background sessions available to execute your job queue. The priority field that was in the table, it has been obsolete. It's not used anymore. So the default uh, job queue does not have that option. Okay, thank you. So I have t-shirts. Oh, almost there. <laughs> Using data exchange framework uh, in combination with XML files. Yeah. You also mentioned CSV files. Can it also import other file types than that? It can. So that the, uh, the code unit that you put in as the reader code unit, mm -hmm. you put that code unit depending on the file type that you have. There is a reader code unit for flat files, for variable files, for XML files, for JSON files, and you can create your own reader. I have, for example, created a reader that reads Excel files. Okay, and you so have not had any situation that you could not map into the data exchange framework yet? No, I have, but I have needed to uh, extend the data exchange framework a little bit. But yeah. I have I've done that to be able to handle all the different file types that I have needed to use. So yeah, I have been able to push things through there in every case. Thank you. Um, in which cases would you prefer to use XML port instead of the data exchange framework? You mean which cases would I skip the data exchange framework? Yeah. Okay, so if uh, I might skip the data exchange framework in order to get the data directly into incoming documents. And then from the incoming documents, I would always use the data exchange framework from there on. In my example here, I'm actually using the data exchange framework first to create the incoming document, and then again, treat the data from the incoming document. So that example that Aaron Jan has where he uh, receives an and uh, PDF attachments for that invoice at contoso.com email and puts that directly into the incoming document, that's perfectly valid as well. Okay. So, 
But it's, I, I like to have the possibility to push it through incoming documents because it could be a different type of document that I want to be able to handle. Okay. All right. Do we have more questions? Over this side. <coughs> All of uh, your examples and uh, the framework, is it already uh, on cloud ready or is the dependency on premises? Because, of, for example, the file management uh, has dropped some functions due to the, to the cloud. The, uh, this framework has the server file system in there as well. If you cut that out, the rest should be SaaS ready. So, Azure, the Azure blob, the Dropbox part, the Azure files, that will all work up in SaaS. It's using uh, it's using uh, functions already in the base app for the authentication part. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, it's SaaS ready. So what is your experience with rapidly executing tasks where you basically export files to one of these file systems? Um, how many files can they take, for example? What, what, what's your experience? At what point would you recommend looking for a different solution? So, so what I do normally is if I have, like in my example, I had a folder called TuneNav in my Dropbox. Uh, what I do when I import the file, I always remove it from that directory. I can archive it to somewhere else. Uh, I, in that setup data service example I had, I exported all the customers to a file service. I think that took about a minute. So, so it's, it is pretty fast. Azure Blob is fast. Thank you very much. There was something over there. To the left. Thank you. Uh, data package question. Uh, I just want to ask if you have some experience with uh, creation, for example, you said the customers creation of documents for the changes on the customers. In that case that you are changing a lot of records. I mean, in, for example, thousands of records from yeah. the perspective of performance and looking of the tables. I don't think I've tried it with that many tables, mm -hmm. but uh, from my point of view, if, 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 if the uh, change doesn't need to be instant, mm -hmm. then the job queue will finish this mm -hmm. in uh, just a few minutes. It, is, uh, it hasn't been any issue with that from my point of view. The thing that I also do with this uh, when you serialize data to an XML, mm -hmm. is you can actually be using that yourself to move data manually from one setup to another. You could actually pack up the whole set of data tables into one XML and just import it on the other side. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, we have been doing for several years now with, with Advania. Okay, thank you. one up there it's done okay that is it then thank you everyone everyone for attending and and have a nice conference <laughs>